Hello, everybody. This is Marlo, uh, Micah from Explorminate, and I have with me a uh, exclusive, I think, exclusive preview of Lord of Rigel. And on uh, Skype with me right now are John and Adam Rohrbaugh, who are the co founders of Rhomba Studios, and they are the masterminds behind this game. Say hello, guys. <laughs> hello. Hi. <laughs> All right, so. These guys are going to take us on a tour uh, of their game, and so um, we're going to start a new game. Let's see what happens. And we are instantly presented, of course, with some of the normal uh, options. Uh, do you have any recommendations? It's really kind of up to whatever you want to do. Um, in terms of kind of what's working, what's working, of course, this is, as it says in the bottom right, a early pre-alpha um the only stuff that's the ai at this point is working but there's no various difficulty levels um and the tech level doesn't work as well what is working though is everything else um on the top end and none of the advanced options work just yet okay, okay. so you can kind of go with whatever size uh you're looking to go for and so the star systems if you size will go from like 32 stars to 1024 um, in, in a legendary galaxy, and um, I'm sorry, did you say sorry, a thousand? A thousand. Yeah. So click on the options stars. and see what it does. Yeah. How uh, does it? I'm sorry, maybe I'm missing it. Does it say what the number of stars is somewhere? It does not. Oh, okay. No, it yeah, we'll add tooltips that will give more information on all these when we're you know further along, I, but. Right, right. Uh, Okay, and I see that the number of, uh, of species is actually changing as we go up mm -hmm. the yes. size scale, um, I guess, and that is uh, to fit, you know, the galaxy where it's not too packed and not too empty, but I guess you could change that independently. Correct. Yes, there are just maximums for galaxies, so for instance, you don't want to shove 12 players into a, you know, 32-star galaxy. Right, yeah, uh. that, that would be, <laughs> uh, might not be that much fun, I guess. And, yeah. Uh, there's right now there's spiral and cluster uh, shaped galaxies. Let's try mm -hmm. spiral. And uh, some of these things, uh, you know, obviously uh, we won't have as quite as enough time to play for some of these things to matter necessarily. Um, but let's have as many anomalies as possible. So maybe we'll find one. And 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 are these options, you know, average, you know, age and richness, are are those going to be similar to what they meant in uh, the Master of Orion series? Yes. Yeah. So, like with star age, that changes the sorts of uh, stars. So, if you have a younger galaxy, there's going to be more blue and white type of stars. If you have an old galaxy, um, you'll have more red dwarfs, neutron stars, and things like that. So, as kind of a little spoiler, if you wind up doing an old galaxy with lots of anomalies, you'll have even more neutron stars and black holes than you normally even would for having a lot of anomalies. Okay, well that makes that makes sense. And, uh, oh, the tech levels are interesting. So developed, I would assume, is kind of your standard, you have mm -hmm. a colony but you have space capabilities you yes. know, uh, level. And then... Yeah. It's, it's not working just yet, um, so of course we have our nifty buttons for now, but it'll be very similar to other 4Xs where you kind of have, like, your least developed being like a, like a colony with low tag, and of course it kind of grows from there. Um, kind of where we're at with the pre-alpha right now is really just getting the uh, stars to spawn, individual uh, uh, colonies start to kind of build up, and you need the AI to work with those, okay. and build okay. its own colonies, and then I believe today one of our coders told me that, that the AI built its first colony ship. Um, so it's it's kind of moving in that direction where we're kind of getting all, all the pieces put in place now to get the, the core game running. Okay. And the one of the options in tech level that you may have seen when you clicked on lived in galaxy where it shows the little Dyson sphere. So this right. is an option that's a bit different than a lot of games have, but it's something that a lot of people have requested when we've read various boards on what sort of features people want. And this type of setting basically randomizes the civilizations. Some of them are going to be pre-warped. Some of them are going to be having big fledgling empires. So it's not a balanced mode because you could wind up pre-warp and somebody else might wind up a little more advanced. 
but it's one of those settings that goes well with um, really huge galaxies, and it adds a little more diversity. Okay. And so, uh, and so just how advanced might some of the ad more advanced uh, species be in the Lipton galaxy? Uh, they might have like a half dozen systems and some small fleets. So they'd be starting early to kind of mid-game, but nothing that you'd be so far behind. Even if you were pre-warp, you couldn't catch up. If you uh, kind of knew the ropes of the game, you had a big enough galaxy to have some breathing room. Okay. Well, and it also sounds like that, that uh, you know, a lot of people like strategy games because you kind of get to create your own narrative as the game goes along, and that sounds like a very mm -hmm. interesting way to kind of set that up for the player. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely one thing with Florida Rigel. We've been really careful, and it's been a key focus for us. Like, our, our slogan is Shape the Galaxy. We could have gone for a ton of different slogans, but we kind of felt like that one was really what we're going for. What we're trying to do with the game is create a backdrop, a stage for the player to kind of act out on. So, and we didn't want to set up uh, the player into a situation where there were kind of these pre-set up stories where you had to fight one species or have an alliance with another because that's what the story lended itself to. Uh, we really wanted the player to be able to kind of say, okay, I want to have an alliance with the species because I like them or I want to kill this one or, you know, I want to build uh, my own kind of, you know, league of nations in space, you know. Um, so it's, it's pretty open. I think we have a, a pretty good lore going on with Lord of Rigel, um, kind of giving the backdrop for the galaxy, but when you jump into it, it's pretty much an open sandbox for you to kind of play in. You shouldn't, the players shouldn't really feel like they're locked into any set path. Yeah, and when you're going through those uh, difficulty settings, one of the ones that popped up when we did an article on our website pretty recently is this 1996 mode, which is kind of our ultra hardcore mode whenever people have said it's like well these games are too easy and the games always cheat and things like that right. well we kind of decided let's have one mode where the AI really cheats it's Iron Man mode you get one life everything is terrible and you're going to lose I was going to ask well, what 1996 mode uh, was breaking. it's just death it's just it's death, death mode. <laughs> and if people right. can actually do that with a custom race with all the negative perks and actually beat a game, well, I guess I'll have to buy them a beer someday. <laughs> Send those good. people on Twitter and be like, you get $5 beer now. And, and, and since, since this is going to be on YouTube, uh, I'm sure someone will hold you to that. All right, well, oh, we, don't yes. wanna, we don't want to spend our, all our time. I promise on... that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to spend all our time on this screen, so I'll take yeah. these yes. options. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I assume we will choose our race, yes. Yeah, um, so some of these, they don't have all the art yet, but um, quite a few of them do. Okay. And so if you, uh, like, what uh, would you recommend as a good starting race for uh, someone new to your game? Would it be the humans? Uh, humans are generally pretty good species to start with uh, because they're kind of the natural diplomats. Um, and so they have some penalties to spying. But um, in general, they would be a little more easy to play and more approachable for a lot of players. But I also look at, yeah, the Catraxi, the Thorn, and the Selak. So the Catraxi are kind of a good military species. Thorn, I would not recommend for new players. They sure they have this huge population growth bonus. Uh, they have this other trait called sapiophage. So they wind up actually getting morale bonuses and population growth bonuses when they're consuming the members of other species. So say you just invade a new colony, and instead of like assimilating that new population into your society, the Tharn wind up sacrificing them. Well, they sound like nice guys. Oh, uh, they're, they're very happy. And uh, the image there is their uh, big sexy lizard lady leader. Right. Okay, there's one with no art. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's no so problem. Um, you can click on the Selak, and they got some artwork. And, oh, cool. Uh, and and these guys the, are the Aranid and the Yalkai do as well. Mm -hmm. Aranid, I really like the artwork. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. the Yalkai are are uh, actually the Yalkai are pretty interesting species too. Uh, yeah. Because they are actually not humanoid at all. They're basically giant starfish, but they fry your brain into thinking that they're members of um, the opposite sex. Oh. Uh, and so it's the sort of act of camouflage that they use. 
Um, but as a society, they're very um, kind of formal and regal, but it's kind of hiding the corrupt underbelly of their warring gray houses. So when you play them, uh, sort of imagine like uh, Dune, where you have all these great houses that are constantly fighting each other. Right, okay. And I see you can do a custom uh, race, and this <laughs> appears to work uh, in a similar way to the uh, Master of Orion system, where you have uh, bonuses, and then you have some some things that uh, give you points back, but, but mm -hmm. give you a, a challenge to overcome once the game starts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you can go up to um, basically negative 10 perks or uh, positive 10 perks. The difference is if you create a super advantageous species, you basically don't get a score, but you can play almost whatever you want. Oh, okay. Um, but if you do a negative 10 score, that means your species has, like, no bonus perks, but you'll get a really high score. All right. That's sort of a bragging rights thing. I mean, reality scores kind of don't matter, but... Um, sure. But no, people fun. might like to share those on Steam. All right, well, I'm going to take the humans. Uh, that might be boring, but... Uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll just go with the uh, default. Oh, uh, hit random, because oh, actually random. we just got this screen uh, working. Um, so okay. it may not be... And you can click the arrows, and it'll go through some of the different faction flags. That's pretty cool. Oh, See, yeah, there okay. was Tharn logo, and yeah. Now, if I pick a, the logo of another race, does the game mm -hmm. recognize that and not use it for the default race if they happen to be in the game? Uh, right now, the default race will be using their species logo, uh, but what we're going to wind up doing is adding a couple of additional and alt logos in here. Um, so that's something that we'll be kind of working on. Okay. Um, but basically, um, for all the AI species, they'll have one set of color and one set of flag, but the customization is in the hands of the player. Right. And then when there's rebel factions, there'll be some alternative uh, flags for them as well once we get to that stage much later in development. All right, well, let's launch into the map here so that people will stop yelling at their computer screens. <laughs> uh, for us to get on with it already, they'll say that, yeah. we're, that we're worse than Daz if, if we waste too much more time. But uh, <laughs> but no, but in all seriousness, it's it's great to see this many options. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the classic games in the genre have the longevity that they do because there's just so mm -hmm. many different ways that you can play them. And so once you get yeah. bored doing one thing, you can try something else. Uh, okay, so tell us what. Obviously, we're looking at the uh, traditional star map where you've got the soul system here in the center. Mm -hmm. And tell me what it is that I'm looking at here in the bottom. So, you have uh, from left to right, you have billions of credits, which is the uh, gold icon. Okay. Uh, command points, uh, which that, yeah, that gets set up by your uh, how many star bases and technologies that you have. Okay. Uh, food surplus is uh, the green little wheat thing. Okay. Uh, the number of freighters that you have, which can be used to move uh, food or colonists around. Oh, and right and, now we uh, have zero. Yeah, you right now don't have any freighters built. And then uh, research, which uh, is showing a little bit of a fancy fancy number. Yeah, so, yeah, research, it, all, all it is is that nothing, nothing's been set yet, and there's a rounding error. Oh, that's, that's, that's really all it is. But once you get everything set, you'll kind of know what's going on. And then if yeah, you, so once you, you hit can, next turn and select the technology. Actually, and you can zoom in and out here as well. Yeah, use the mouse wheel. Okay. Yeah. And then oh, zoom so, all the way out. So we can see our galaxy here. Yeah. And, and can you, you pan around? Yeah, oh, yeah, W A S yeah. and D. Yeah, WASD, or you move the cursor to the edge of the screen. We're trying to make this, by default, pretty intuitive. This is really cool. And I'm and right really now you digging the music. The... Who, who made the music? Blue Adam Audio. Um, and uh, his, his, the guy's name is uh, Steve Marciano. Um, that's interesting. None. Uh, yeah, that's the synth home world right now because we don't actually have the. Uh, oh yeah, because, yeah. Because, now, yeah. is it intended that I can see where the other races' home worlds are? Uh, for now, yes, because we're doing this for debug purposes, so we know that if the AI is working. Ah, right. Okay, so when the when the game is released to the public, of course, you won't know. No. Yeah, unless you pick a certain trait that lets you actually see all the other uh, start locations, um, which is an option for players. Um, you won't be seeing everybody's home worlds unless they're in sensor range. And one of the cool little features that we have, and it's just kind of gimmicky, but I love it, 
And we're, actually, one of our developers thought of this because they kept getting lost in the galaxies. If you can go pan someplace else, go pan wherever you want to go pan real quick. If you hit your H key. H. Okay. H. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Takes you right back home. Why every and, game doesn't have that, I don't know. And, yeah, it's funny because our developers, you know, they're constantly in the game and they're testing all the time and they're just like, I'm really, I'm sick of like going to one colony to check on the AI and then like I have to go pan and go find my other colony, you know, again. So like we really should have a key for this and so they, they developed this home key, uh, which has actually been really useful. Yeah. I mean, in the end, we're going to have to probably do some adjustments. Like, what if your home world gets blown up, right? And having to lock it to whatever your capital is. But, you know, for now, um, it does all of its stuff. Okay. So, yeah, click on system. Yeah, let's, let's go uh, to see the system. And here is our solar system, and you can zoom in and out on this a bit, it looks like. Yeah. Yep. And you can uh, left click and drag. Oh, okay. And you can uh, adjust your view. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Earth is... Uh, oh, I can't quite pan that way. Uh, but there's... Yeah. Soul, 5. Soul 5. That's the home world in this. Because they're randomized systems. Right. Yeah. So so there'll be no Mars or Pluto or anything like that. It'll just be, you know, random ran random Earth-like planet. Oh, no, yeah. a small toxic planet. That's no good. We'll have to nuke that. Well, but <laughs> here's the cool thing. So, actually, real quick, uh, get the camera to go right behind it. Right behind Yeah, go okay. right up behind a toxic planet. Yeah, go behind a toxic planet. This is one of these really cool Unity things that we found that's just, uh, uh, so it's so nifty, and it just adds to a cool layer of uh, ambience. Yeah, I, I created some nice little pixel shaders for this guy. Oh, go up. So if you look at our toxic planet, you'll we'll see the night side. Oh, yeah, I see that. So it actually has lightning storms. Okay. Now, for, for the viewers, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on YouTube, but... But basically, it, it looks like if you see lightning from a, a you know some distance away, maybe you know a storm off in the distance, and you can just see the clouds kind of lighting up. That's that's kind of what's going on in the atmosphere of this toxic planet. Uh, like I say, I don't know if you'll be able to see it in YouTube or not, but uh, but uh, if you can't, that's kind of what it looks like. It's a very cool effect, actually, and I and I assume that there will be visual effects maybe for some other types of worlds as well eventually. Yeah, so one of the things that we're going to try to do um, is with uh, planets that, for instance, are colonized on the dark side, you'll actually have, they'll actually light up. And as they get more population, they'll get more lights, more city lights. Oh, that's really cool. And then one of the things that we're starting to talk about, there's some logistical things that we need to worry about with this, but um, putting objects in orbit, so if you build orbital defenses and things like that, Oh, that they uh, show up. Star yeah. base yeah. in orbit. So there's a couple logistic issues in regards to uh, if you obviously put stuff in orbit, you're expanding the diameter of the planet. And when you get into really uh, close planets that are near the star, you don't want them to you know overlap and, and uh, hit each other. So we'll have to figure that out, but that's definitely someplace that we are talking about going with okay. uh, okay. adding more stuff to the map and maybe even looking at something that, like a, um, if you have a fleet in system, having some sort of fleet icon floating on the outer edge of the star system. Nice. nice. That would be, yeah, that would be great. And those kind of visual cues, uh, I think, are really helpful from a gameplay point of view as well. Um, but here we are on Earth where uh, we have the White House, a couple of Guggenheims, and an Ikea. Yep, <laughs> yep that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I realize that, of course, the, uh, you know, a couple of these, these buildings are placeholders, obviously. Mm -hmm. yep. um, the backgrounds are great. Uh, they are, uh, I, I think we saw some in, in some of the artwork um, with, the with the leaders um, kind of behind them. To some yes. In one or two of them, but uh, now here's a question. One of my favorite moments in Master of Orion 2 is when you colonize a new planet and the little colony pods come down, mm -hmm. you know, and then they land on the planet. I don't know why, but since 1996, I have watched that animation every single time. I never click through it. It's one of my favorite parts of the game. <laughs> Are you going to put it in there? We'd like to do something similar to that, um, but there's a there's a lot of stuff when it comes to you know time and budget because we're a very small team. Oh, of course. Um, we've even been talking to somebody about potentially doing some uh, animations, but a lot of this stuff is still at a 
kind of no promises stage. This is where the crowdfunding at the end of the month comes in. Sure. Uh, because that will help us be able to put those bells and whistles and be able to get this done. Sure, sure. Um, Not to sound like too much of a shell. No, no. <laughs> hey, I, I get it. I get it. And, uh, but, you know. But definitely, you know, one thing I want to say, too, because you brought up a great point with the colony landing scene, um, is that there's just. There's a lot of stuff like that. Like I think when I first, first played Master of Ryan, I think I was about 11 years old. And um, it was absolutely an amazing game because one of the things that that the, one of the things that Master of Ryan 2 did versus a lot of a lot of modern 4X games is is that you kind of didn't get that sense of awe and wonder and a, a sense of progression like you do. Like a lot of 4X games now um, when you're kind of building up your city, it seems more um, distant, so you'll kind of have, like, like Star Drive 2 uses a series of hexes. Civilization just kind of expands a little bit, but you really can't get into the core of the city and really see it grow. And that was one of the things we were thinking about doing um, Lord of Rigel and looking at, like, this planetary scene here. It was one of the first things, is like, this is how we're going to do the uh, colony view. Because I've always loved the fact that just like when you're landing on the colony and you're first getting it started, you can kind of see that progress occurring. Right, um, right. As, as you're building your colony in Lord of Rigel and in Master of Ryan 2, you can see new buildings crop up. And you kind of get that sense that you're progressing and moving in the right direction. And I think it really helps the player kind of get immersed and build a uh, sense of attachment to these colonies and and try to defend them the best way that they can. Now let me ask let me you ask. a couple of questions about the uh, interface yeah. here. I see sure. we have some little uh, people representatives. Mm -hmm. and now yes. at the moment, you can't drag them around. Is that something uh, that yes you, you can? You can? Should be. Yeah, click on them. Oh. Uh, oh, wait, there he yeah, goes. There you go. Huh. Okay, I was trying to do that before, but uh, <laughs> I was having, having some difficulty. Maybe their hitbox is... Uh, yeah, they may need to be adjusted. Or something yeah. Like that. yeah, and especially to, uh, like I was um, saying earlier, well, prior to the call, um, new version of Unity came out today, and I was like, oh, we have to get the nifty performance updates in. So there may be a couple things that have adjusted in the Unity GUI system that we'll need to adjust, but yeah, you'll be able to click and drag and all that stuff. It's it's kind of amazing, like, it's one thing I'm learning as a non-technical person getting into game making. Um, it's just how like little changes constantly happen in code or in design and it just ends up causing all these problems you can like revisit old things again um <laughs> but yeah the, the, getting these little guys to move like it took quite a bit of work because <laughs> i think we had a build issue on one of these right right but uh but yeah they, they, all, they all should be working but they will be replaced they're just kind of placeholder art for sure now. sure actually i kind of like the way they are right now actually just kind of in their <laughs> abstract form uh, it's kind of kind of it's very clean and it's easy to see exactly how many people you've got doing what. And it just jumps out immediately at you, and there's a lot to be said for that. But uh, one one thing it does bring to mind is you know one of the one of the criticisms of Master of Orion 2 uh, and and some other games that have followed in its footsteps is that they get really micromanagement heavy as the game goes on because mm -hmm. the temptation is to adjust what every single little person is doing on every single colony that you have. <laughs> So, yes. do you guys have a plan to make that a little less painful as the as the as you get so into the late game? So, click on the click on the build button. All right. Build, I say. Okay, here we go. So, uh, down on the uh, lower uh, right corner, there's Q options. So it's not working right now. Okay. But there, you'll be able to select. Um, for, well, there's going to be two things you can do. You can do a pull down, which will be. Uh, like industry farming or balance or research, and you can click auto build, and it'll allow the AI to completely take it over with those priorities. The other thing too is you see those load and save buttons. You'll be able to take your build cues and you can save them into a list, and then you can load pre-done build cues. So if you have like a certain queue and you don't want to trust the AI to do it, right. you can just load up a pre-done queue. And that queue could be for buildings, it could be for ships and support ships and such, and you can just use that. Okay. And then I assume that when it got to the end of the queue, the game will probably notify me in some way and say, hey, dummy, come do something with us, right? 
Yes, that would be the plan. It would, when it's empty, it would default to trade goods, but you'd know that there's no construction. Yes. I see. Okay, yeah, because I'm a really negligent emperor, and I, uh, <laughs> if the game doesn't tell me that I need to do something somewhere, I will definitely leave a planet, uh, you know, um, just idle for turn after turn after turn. Uh, no, no compunction about that whatsoever. Okay, so you can you can make your own build queue, you can save it, and then when I colonize a new planet, I can load that build queue and go mm -hmm. off and do other things. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's you can also let the AI manage your colonies if that's what you prefer as well. Okay. And, and, and it should be reasonably smart because it will be using the same uh, rules that the main AI for the uh, different civilizations use. Now, would it be possible, or, or is it something that you've considered uh, about setting, and maybe this would have the same dysfunction that I'm about to ask about, but, but when it comes to uh, actually moving the people around to different jobs, could you, when you set... Um, you know, would it be possible to tell the AI, you know, I really want this planet, yes, I want it to build these buildings, but I need to get some research out of this planet. So, mm. when, I, so when it grows, put him in science instead of something else. So right now, the plan is, um, in that pull-down where you do the AI and auto-build, it right. will shuffle the citizens around by those priorities. Ah. So if you want to do something like, well, I want to build these items, but I really do want them into uh, industry, that level of micromanagement, you'll have to mix uh, a pre done build queue of your own with um, putting the citizens where you want. Because we want to kind of keep it simple with, like, is it, you know, industry? Is it, um, you know, research? And it'll just focus on building those buildings and assigning the citizens to those things and keeping the colony kind of going. Right. So when you use the AI here, the whole priority is, you know, make sure your colony doesn't collapse. And then next thing is doing industry, doing research, or whatever you're assigning it to. So what you're, you're asking for is a you know, good idea, but that's a little more advanced than what we're hoping on this. Sure, uh, because sure. you know, if we do that, it's like, well, let's have an industry build with everybody assigned to research. Then we're going to get like 90 options down there, right? right? And that starts making it kind of defeats the purpose of having the system. Sure, For sure. players who just want to go and be like, this needs to be an agricultural world. I'm going to drag and click farming and click auto build, and I don't have to have to come back to this planet. Well, it sounds like the system you have in mind will, will greatly reduce the uh, the necessity for folks who, who maybe aren't, Interested. Some people really like micromanagement, of course, but, mm -hmm. but it sounds like the system that you have uh, in mind will will help a lot with that, both with the, the your workers and with your and with your buildings. And so, all right. So the screen route right now is the mm -hmm. traditional build queue, and right now it looks like we can build housing, a freighter fleet, and a colony ship. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, and then these are the the blue text are those are mm -hmm. our categories. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Which you'll have to research to uh, start unlocking items in those. Right, right. Okay, and there is right. a ship designer, which we mm -hmm. I understand we're going to get to in a in a different video, but uh, but yes. you could access yeah. it with this button here. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And uh, now I notice that there's not a scout. Uh, you have to right now design the scout. We're going to put in some default designs. I, I see. Uh, okay. Yeah, you don't want to send but. a colony ship where the space hydra might be lurking, right? Yes. <laughs> Fortunately, there are no space monsters quite yet, um, but there will be um, a definite rogues gallery of uh, terrible and horrible things out there that will eat your ships. Okay. Now, um, all right. So we've. What else uh, can we uh, can we see here in the uh, kind of the strategic mode? Uh, well, as I'm actually going to suggest where you're at now. It would make sense to actually go into the ship designer and build a quick scout ship. Okay. Well, i tell you what. We're going to... Uh, well, yeah, let's do that. Um, hold on. Let me check my timer here. Uh, we got a... Well, we're coming up here on 30 minutes, I think. Uh, Uh-oh. Yeah, it goes by fast, doesn't it? Um, but, <laughs> but that's okay, YouTube viewers. Uh, we are going to record another video that has to do with ship design and uh, the combat. Uh, because the uh, that's in the game. So um, come back next time, and we're going to have another video uh, that has to do uh, with those elements of the game. Uh, and until then, uh, hope you're doing well.
And uh, check out the, our thread uh, on this game on our Steam forums if you haven't already. There's a lot of good information. Uh, these guys have been posting a lot of screenshots and updates. Uh, their website's really good, too. And what's the name of your website, guys? It's uh, lordofrigel.com. Okay, and uh, real quick, and of course we'll talk about this again in the second video, but when is your Kickstarter campaign going to start? It'll be uh, September 28th, so we, it'll be, what, I think two and a half weeks away. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of been putting feelers out there for everyone and posting all stuff on Facebook and Twitter, um, trying to get a hold of the media. Obviously, Explore Money, it's been awesome and very supportive of the project. So. And do you know what your goal will be, how much you're going to try to raise? Yeah, um, our target goal is, uh, actually, hang on, I think we just changed it recently, because we actually did some serious number crunching to see if we can try to lower our goal, um, and yep, it, we, we are going to be raising $90,000, we figure by the time everyone gets their cut, you know, Kickstarter gets their cut, and, um, you know, uh, Amazon gets their processing fees, um, that will be a realistic uh, amount of money for us to complete the project. We already have the whole game designed at this point, um, and we kind of have a good idea of what our monthly pacing is like in terms of our artwork and our coding. So we're looking for a June 2016 release. Um, so it should be done really soon. I know a lot of 4X games have kind of dragged it out for a really long time, and we're, we're hoping that... Uh, with that kind of a deadline, um, that should really entice people to want to support the project because they'll actually see the goods uh, much sooner. So, all right, all right, all right, folks. All right, folks. That's it for this video. Uh, be sure and check out the next one, and we're going to look at ship design, and we're going to see some combat, and uh, hopefully, I won't die. See you then. <laughs>